welcome and thank you very much for coming to our session on Avatar Interactions. I hope we didn't lure anyone in here uh, thinking that we were going to be talking about the movie Avatar. <laughs> uh, I know that's kind of uh, catchy right now. As a matter of fact, even though I work in Second Life, I have not seen the movie yet. And I know, and, and people are chastising me for that, but uh, at any rate. Uh, <laughs> Um, what we're going to talk about today is um, kind of what it means to be an avatar in, in Second Life specifically, although there are, you can be avatars in, in other uh, areas as well. My name is Sue Schick, and I do the Second Life thing here at Case, and uh, I have with me uh, Dr. Tom Nosek uh, from the Physiology Department in the School of Medicine. Um, the, Jean Hitch was going to be here, but yeah. <laughs> her real life person uh, tripped over her real life dog and broke her real life shoulder. So I'm her which, avatar. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so Drew is kindly uh, going to replace uh, Jean today. And then we have Anita Alexander from uh, NASA, the Glenn Research Center. So I'm going to start off just really basic, talking about what an avatar is and tell, talk a tiny bit about what Second Life is. I'm going to uh, tell a little bit of an introduction of how uh, some interesting experiences I had uh, in Second Life during my first month in there. And then we're going to go on to Tom. He's going to talk about a fascinating project that he's doing in there. Then we're going to go to Drew uh, or Andrew <laughs> and uh, talk about what they're doing at the Simulation Center. And then Anita is going to wrap it up for us and bring us back into a generalized discussion of what it means to be an avatar. So um, let's go. Okay, what is Second Life? I'm, I don't know how many of you in here don't know about Second Life. Can I have a show of hands of people who have no idea what Second Life is? Oh, good, so you kind of know. It is a three-dimensional world, right? It's a virtual world. It's online. It's free to join, which is, you know, something that's really kind of important for us. It is a platform. It's not a game. It's actually a platform where people can come on and they can build things. They can script things. There's a scripting language there. Um, there's voice chat, text chat. So you can do lots and lots of different uh, social networking and then, of course, work, learn, and play. And we all do that as avatars. So it's inhabited by avatars. Um, last time I looked, there were, uh, Linden Lab says there are approximately 15 million um, avatars that are in the world right now. And um, the, if you look at some of the demographics, it's kind of interesting. When we first started out, most avatars or most of the inhabitants that came in were women that were about in their 30s. Now it appears as though it, that's changed and we have a lot more men in Second Life right now. But then I've also heard and that some research has been done also that men oftentimes like to be women in Second Life. I don't know why. But uh, it's a, you know, <laughs> just to start off the conversation about uh, what it means to be an avatar in Second Life. You do not have to be yourself. Okay, in Second Life. This is a little ad that I just found that j just recently came out, shows a real life person who is uh, Christine Casablanca. She's a CEO. And in real life, that's her over there. And then that is the avatar that she's created in Second Life. And this is obviously someone, her, her name in Second Life is Tersus on a teen. Now, in Second Life, if you've created an avatar before, you'll know you have a choice of first names usually that you can choose, but the last name you, you have to choose from a list of last names, and some of them can be a little bit um, different. Like I think we had someone with a, what was delightful do wangle. Were you in the, the the session earlier today? There was an avatar asking a question, and her name was delightful do wangle, and that fascinates me too. Why people choose the names that they choose. Um, I found this just recently, an avatar, uh, Obama and uh, the, first, the First Lady uh, in Second Life. So someone has actually come in there and actually created the skin and the mesh or the body shape, uh, the clothing, et cetera, that, that creates this 3D representation of someone. Um, you do not have to be a human being. <laughs> you don't have to be uh, live, or, or you can be a zombie, or I don't know exactly what this character is. Have you ever seen that in, in anything? It looks like it's kind of half skeletal with a little bit of some bird arms or whatever. So people actually do create some very interesting avatars, and they sell them uh, to other people who are interested in, you know, doing um, you know, role play or whatever they want to do in that. And then I thought that this was an interesting avatar. It just kind of shows that uh, you can take off that outside skin. This is actually a real skin in Second Life, but it, it looks like it's, you know, a human being without... It's skin on. <laughs> so, um, and then I kind of wanted just to, real quickly, because I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, my uh, 
avatar in Second Life is Suzanne Patrono. So I was just thinking what, what my digital footprint is on Suzanne Patrono. I haven't uh, Googled that yet, you know, <laughs> so we'll see what kind of trouble she's gotten into. Um, but, uh, you know, ever since my, actually my second week in Second Life, I have started to realize that um, I can be all sorts of different things in Second Life. I don't have to just be Sue Schick and, and represent myself as this character that I have, Suzanne Patrono. Right now, I think I have pro approximately 40 different avatar looks that I can switch into. So that's why I said de desperately seeking Suzanne. I'm not exactly sure who she is. Um, I, I change roles depending on, on what's needed at a particular moment. I'll tell you, I, I never in a, a million years thought that I would ever end up doing avatar creation as one of my roles in Second Life. So I started off as a biochemist, and now to end up doing something like this, it's been a fascinating journey. But um, I wanted to share with you, I, 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 I think I feel safe enough in this audience to do this, um, an experience I had during my second week in uh, Second Life. Uh, Lev Gonick actually um, wanted us to take pictures in Second Life. And there was only one avatar on our islands, which was me at that time, because we were just starting. Um, and so, you know, all of the pictures we had were of these beautiful buildings, and then there's Suzanne sitting there, you know, with her pink hair or whatever. So I thought, okay, I'm going to please love, and I'm going to change into a guy, you know? So it would look like there was a, a male avatar in there with us. And so <laughs> what I did was I, you know, not knowing how open Second Life is, I thought I was going to go over into a little area on our island that was kind of covered with trees, and I, I was, I was going to change into a guy, you know? So no one else is around me. I'm safe. I'm doing this. I'm changing my skin and my shape and everything into a, into a male. And uh, all of a sudden, I see on my chat thing, you know, Lev's, Lev's character, Lev book is telling me, well, you're sporting a different look today, Sue. You know, and I'm like, oh, my. I, I said, I said, this isn't what it looks like. You know, I was just like, already I had kind of become attached to my avatar, even in, you know, a two-week period of time. Um, so at any rate, that was one of the first experiences I had, I call it my cross-gender experience, um, where I actually was then interacting with Lev as a, as a man rather than as a woman. And I found that personally I was willing to say things to my superior as a man uh, that I would never have said as, as Suzanne. Suzanne would just, you know, timidly say, um, am I in your way? And then, you know, fly off or whatever. But this, you know, at any rate. So that's what started me uh, off thinking about all these fascinating things of why do people, I mean, I have to create particular avatars. Why, in, in other cases, people just using this as a social networking platform, why do they choose to be the avatars that they do? Why do most men that come on there choose to be female avatars? I, I have no idea. Um, I think there's, there's tons of research that can be done along these lines. And so now, what, what the question that I wanted to do, and the reason I brought this panel together, is so that we can kind of talk about how, as avatars, we come into Second Life and we have, we do certain things. We role play or we go through simulations or just interact. Does that experience then affect and translate to our real life? Does it change our real life behaviors? And is what we experience in Second Life valid experience that will translate over to real life? So Tom Nosek has done some unbelievable things. I first met him. Uh, well, actually, I, I've known you for a long time, but we first started working together in Second Life. Um, I was creating the physiology department uh, for Tom in Second Life. We had the whole department in there. One of the reasons we wanted to do that was so that we could have uh, the faculty come into an environment that they felt comfortable in. Well, Tom has taken this to an, a, a totally different level, and uh, I, he's doing some unbelievable work right now. So I'm going to Let's hand see. this over to you. and yeah. I'd like to uh, share with you some experiences we've had. Oops. Did it just, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I thought that would happen. Did, I hit, did I hit something? No, I think it was this, when we moved this. Uh, this is not the traditional use uh, you might think of uh, learning resources for a university. It's taking it beyond that, uh, certainly working with university uh, people but we're extending the environment to uh, people outside the university to see how we can use this kind of a learning resource. Let's quit. I don't know what oh. it's... Uh... 
doesn't like me? No, no. Okay. I hope. <laughs> okay, I hope it likes me. Okay, so uh, we're developing a self-esteem intervention in Second Life for women with disabilities. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions as we go along. And why a professor of physiology and biophysics would get involved in this is a whole other seminar. Uh, but this is in collaboration with my sister, Dr. Margaret Nosek, who might possibly be watching this uh, online in Second Life right now. If you are, Peg, hello. Uh, but she's the director of the Center for Research on Women and Disabilities at Baylor College of Medicine. And so this is a collaboration that we're doing together. And as it turns out, over the years, a number of the people who have worked with her in Houston have spread out. And so now the collaboration extends to people in, at the University of Montana, out to California, uh, University of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and as a result of working on the project, we really have collaborations with people all over the world. And I've never met them. I only know them through their avatars. And uh, some of them I, they won't even tell me where they are, so I don't even know where they are. It's an interesting world. But women with disabilities face barriers to maintaining positive self-esteem. And this is part of the research that uh, uh, Margaret's group has done in Baylor. Uh, internalizing negative social stereotypes about disability. Limited opportunities for education, social interaction, and community involvement. Lack of access to mental health providers. High rates of abuse on all levels. Low rates of employment and pervasive poverty. So in the uh, enhancement workshops, so after doing the research on these various issues and trying to figure out ways that they can help people with disabilities face these uh, uh, extreme issues that affect self-esteem, they put together workshops. Uh, and these were face-to-face -face workshops, and they found that there was an improvement in the measures of self-esteem as a result of the women getting together, going through exercises, learning a little bit, realizing that they're not alone in facing these issues, then having social interaction on a face-to-face -face basis. So there is improvement, and there's a reduction of the symptoms of depression. But they discovered that there are problems working with this group of people in a face-to-face -face environment. And that's how come just under casual conversations, we were discussing some of the issues my sister was having at work. Some of these are the transportation limitations. People with disabilities have transportation issues. They can't always get to that face-to-face -face event. Problems with personal assistance services. If they have to go someplace, then if they have an assistant, that assistant has to go there as well. That all has to be coordinated. Taking care of child care, if they have children, and again, they have to leave their children to do this, it may be difficult. Health issues, if they're having a bad day with, uh, say, uh, pain management, and they're just not up to going into a face-to-face -face interaction, they're not going to show. And what my sister found out is that maybe only half uh, of the time were, were the women actually able to attend these workshops. They were beneficial when they could get there, but half the time they just couldn't get there for one reason or another. So what, uh, what to do about this? So we knew a little bit about social cognitive theory. And one is that humans can learn behaviors through observations of models. And there's a study by Fox and Balenson in 2009 on the effects of vicarious reinforcement and identification on behaviors. So in the vicarious environment. And they found that virtual environments have the capability of creating ideal self models that can motivate individuals to adopt new health practices or positively, positively mon modify existing ones. So this is sort of the key issue. This is what we were ourselves intuiting that we could do this in Second Life. But now there's some research mainly coming out of Stanford uh, that is addressing these issues. And so. Uh, also, with the virtual environments, we have the potential for behavioral therapies to help people attain their health goals. So with this kind of background, uh, we decided to look more into these immersive virtual environments and see if this could help us out with the problems that we were facing. So if you have a virtual environment, it does increase feelings of environmental and social presence. It's kind of weird. If you've ever been in Second Life, it's hard to ex explain it to anybody because you just lose all sense of what's real. One of my sons will say, that's not real, Dad. I said, well, it's really real to me. And, and Sue's, Sue and I have had some funny experiences. Sue and I were going to have a meeting together, and she was supposed to come over at 1.30. 1.30 came, Sue didn't show up. And I'm waiting. And so there. about a half an hour, I call her up. I say, Sue, I thought we were going to meet. She says, I am. I'm waiting for you. I says, what are you talking about? She says, we're going to meet in Second Life. 
<laughs> so our second life and our real life sort of blends together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Individuals feel that they are interacting with their virtual surroundings instead of the physical space they occupy. So you lose yourself in these physical <laughs> surroundings. And that's what's so wonderful about Second Life. It sounds like all of you have probably been in there. But uh, it's a wonderful template for creativity, and people have won, uh, built in incredible environments that uh, are really ideal. And uh, also, these virtual environments produce greater connection with other digital human rep uh, representations in the same virtual space, and that these avatars can influence real behavior. There was a second life study that was just completed on 80 individuals where they followed these uh, individuals who hadn't been in second life before and just to follow their activities, their interactions and so forth to see how they interacted with, the, uh, with that environment. And they found that with time in second life that the individuals spent more time in populated areas. So they were drawn to interactions with other people. They made more friends. You know about making friends in Second Life. They joined more groups that represented their particular interests. It supported the hypothesis that time online can lead to an increase in social capital gains. And their conclusion was, quote, our virtual lives and physical lives are not independent. Our actions have both online and offline consequences. Kind of interesting. Maybe a little scary, but interesting. So we have uh, funding from the National Institute on Disability and Rehab Rehabilitation Research, and the goal of that particular study is to use Second Life to deliver the self-esteem enhancement intervention to women who face barriers to attending a face-to-face -face workshop related to self-esteem. And our idea is to evaluate the efficacy of the program, uh, looking at user satisfaction, their ability to understand uh, the instru uh, instructional material that we're going to provide to them, uh, the meaningfulness of the group, group interactions, and the achievement of the desired outcomes, which is to compare the outcomes of the face-to-face -face interventions with the one in Second Life, which will basically mimic what we have done in a face-to-face -face environment in Second Life using avatars. So this is the Garden of Wellness that we've created with Sue's help, and uh, this is part of one of the case islands. And we call it the Garden of Wellness. We have another project that we did before that was just web-based that was called the, the Garden of Wellness that was funded by the CDC that was a precursor to this and encouraged us to pursue it. But we've created uh, uh, an environment where we will put on face-to-face, uh, well, face-to-face -face with avatars. See, again, I'm confusing yeah, yeah. the worlds. Uh, they'll come in with their avatars and we'll get to know them as their avatars. And then there'll be instructional uh, presentations about various issues, and then we have designed activities for them to interact with each other and then also to go off into the greater world of Second Life and interact with other people that are not part of our group, and then to come back and to discuss those interactions in Second Life. So here is uh, the Center for Research on Women with Disabilities created in Second Life with Sue's help. I destroyed the whole island at one point, and I, I called Sue up late one night and said, Sue, I was, I was terraforming over here, and then <laughs> the house went. <laughs> it, was, it was underwater or someplace. So uh, you got to be careful. And so it's good to have Sue there to, to help you out when you get into trouble. But whenever we get online, all these people I was telling you about, some of whom I've never met, others who are spread out all over the world, we just set our clocks and say we're going to meet in Second Life, and we use it to have meetings to plan out exactly what we're doing and to test things out. The program itself is going to start in the next couple weeks. We're just re finishing recruiting women. And here's, again, the beauty of it. We can recruit women from any place in the world, anybody who, who wants to come into it. This is uh, inside. You can see that we've got a nice living area so we can sit. I've got a little cushion over there that I like to put myself in. I'm really in the minority in this. I'm the only male, as far as I know. <laughs> you could be a female I, if you wanted Yeah, to. but I don't want to go there. <laughs> but... Uh, as far as I know, I'm the only male uh, in this environment. But we have these whiteboards. I don't know if I, yeah, I can point at it here. Uh, so we have these media screens, and uh, the new version 2.0 of the Second Life Viewer is very powerful. We can get into any website. We can use uh, whiteboards and so forth uh, to interact uh, with the, uh, the women who are going to be in the study. And then we have some fun. We have outdoor areas for teaching the sessions and the social interaction. We put in a pool with a hot tub. And then there is, uh, it's serious stuff, because here's another media thing. But you could be in a swimming suit. And we also have a bar, but I don't know what the liquor policy is. Uh. 
It's I, your private space. It's my private space, so yeah. it's okay? All yeah. Right. I, this is I, on the, I, this, lips are sealed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You won't tell anybody. Yeah. And then here's stays, just a, a small uh, view of our little, little world here. Uh, we have uh, really, a, I think, a very attractive area. We have um, a water pond. Uh, we have a little mountain uh, view that looks out over everything. And again, it has a media display, so we can have meetings up there. We have a little gazebo over here. We have an amphitheater and just places for people to walk around. Behind the trees, we've got a waterfall, and uh, you can dolphin walk ride. into the waterfall. I'm sorry? The dolphin ride? Do you still we have, have the that? dolphin ride, but I'm having trouble with the dolphin ride. That's, that's another, the, that's another story. They, they just want to take off. Yeah. And then, as I said, that the, the project will be where the people will come into our island, get oriented to a second life. We've developed a guide that within 30 minutes we've had experience being able to get people to, to uh, have the necessary skills to navigate in second life, to turn on the audio and use audio. We'll be using audio with all the uh, people in the, in the program as well. Uh, then I guess I'll know whether they're male or female. There we go. So we, you can use voice modulators. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so, yeah, okay. we were just talking about that. So again, there'll, there'll be the programs that we have there. There'll be social interactions. They'll get to know people in their groups. There'll be groups of six women uh, that'll go through this at a time. Uh, and then we'll send them out into Second Life. Like here, I just uh, did a search on France. So we plan on sending them out to an old reconstruction of France, let them go out, meet people, interact, come back and talk about their experiences. And I just want to make a comment about a couple of new projects that we're working on with the Veterans Administration that I think is very exciting. We'll see where that goes. Uh, we gave a presentation on what we were doing, and one of the researchers at the VA in Houston heard it and was very excited about possibly using the virtual environments for interventions with uh, veterans coming back from the wars in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan with mild traumatic brain injury. And also the second one is virtual social networking for community reintegration of disabled women veterans. So uh, there's a lot of issues with uh, soldiers coming back with the mild traumatic brain injury, reintegrating back into the communities. And we're hoping to help them in this very safe environment. So if they get uncomfortable, they can't handle things, poof, they can just leave and, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to help them. So these are two projects that we're working on now with the VA. And I got a picture of my sister. She's down on the beach. And as soon as we get done with this, I'm going to go try to join her on the beach in, in, <laughs> in, real, in, in, in real world. Oh, in real oh, world. Oh, man. You have to That's get that That's very nice. You know. Thank you. Now, we just have to be careful with this so we don't disconnect. Thank you so much, Tom. That was really Connection. Connect. Watch the oh. connection. There we go. All right. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. You gotta love it. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'll be talking today um, about uh, some of the things that we've done. Um, uh, at our Sim Center, we, we're the Center for Skills and Simulation, which comprises the Mount Sinai Skills and Simulation Center, and Izzy, the Institute for Surgery and Innovation, uh, Innovation over at UH. So, um, the uh, Mount Sinai Skills and Simulation Center has done, um, uh, has, I mean, has has done different projects uh, with with uh, Sue, and uh, and a couple of people with the dental school, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, we have five different types of simulation at the Sim Center, um, and two of which I'll be just discussing today, which is the virtual reality component that we're that we're continuing to to work with, and also our sterilized patients. Which, if anyone I don't know if anybody knows what a sterilized patient is, but uh, what that is is a person who uh, portrays a role um, and pretends to have an ailment or whatever else, and that could be, uh, you know, in um, in any type of situation. So I'll get into that more later. But what, we, what we're going to be, do, what we do, uh, or what can Second Life can provide uh, in medicine, is things like you know medical teaching, clinical skills, um, which is obviously a you know a huge component, and there, there's so many so many aspects that that uh, can, can be just really your your mind is. I'm trying to think of the word. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, it boggles the mind, but just you know, the sky's the limit. Your imagination is so opened up with with um, with this. Um, patient care is another component, and one thing that I've that I've read about was that people who have a hard time talking to doctors can use Second Life as a way to go 
and practice what they're going to be saying to their doctors prior to actually going in there and talk to them. Because sometimes they feel intimidated, uh, you know, depending on educational levels or whatever else. And so if you, if you can uh, set up a situation where you can actually discuss what it is you want, because I know I've experienced that in my life and even working in the medical profession, sometimes you're like, you just feel like, you know, okay, what am I going to ask the doctor? And if you practice that in advance, uh, you know, that people, because mind can be, um, put at ease in that regards. Um, another big one is, is safety. So teaching people just uh, the simple things like here, you know, hand washing. You know, if you, if you go into a room uh, and you're observing what a, what a student might be doing or whatever else, it's like, do they go over to the sink in the virtual world and, and wash their hands, you know? And then, you know, if you don't, you, you know, teach them, tell them, go over and wash their hands, and then they'll, you know, uh, go and, and uh, that'll transfer into the real life and realize, hey, you gotta go wash my hands. So. Um, and teamwork, that, that's a huge thing. Obviously, the interaction within Second Life, uh, the social interaction is, is huge. And obviously, in medicine, teamwork and communication are, are essential. And um, I don't know if everybody looks this beautiful. And anyway, the, everyone, everyone's always, it's always beautiful. That's, that's one thing I always noticed in Second Life. Everyone's always so much, it's like, you know, LA. Everybody, everybody in a sense, like LA. But anyway, so everybody's always beautiful. So, um, <laughs> You don't want to know an ugly avatar unless you're some bird skeleton monster, I suppose. You have that in your in the medical profession. But, um, and then, uh, and obviously communication. So this photo is an actual, um, is a, we videotaped the interactions that we had done with the dental school research. And I'll get in a little bit about that. There was, uh, there was three components to the research. The actual human-to-human uh, -human interaction in, in a clinical environment like you would have um, at any kind of you know exam room type of thing where you actually have a you know a, a human student interacting face to face with a uh, you know with with a standardized patient and then also there was a um, uh, where you would have the human student would interact as a human talking to um, an avatar as a uh, and that was like a puppeteer avatar and they would just be sitting in front of a uh, they would just be sitting in front of a uh, flat screen plasma interacting with that avatar where someone was in another room actually manipulating the uh, the movements of that avatar uh, you know hand movements eye movements you know all that kind of stuff and then the third component which is what you see here where it was the student student was an avatar interacting with a standardized patient in another room who was also an avatar and they were interacting as student and um, uh, as student, student dentist, doctor, student dentist, doctor, and, uh, and patient avatar. And uh, it's hard to see in this, it, on this screen, but if you look at the, the, um, uh, the, the, the computer monitor, uh, this is what it, what it was. So this was different than the puppeteer sense in the fact that the puppeteer was just the, the person like that you see here, just standing there talking as though you'd have a conversation just with nothing behind you where in Second Life, you're able to construct the actual dental office and make it look like a dental office. So I, I think in that regards, I think there was you know, more buy-in because you're, you're able to wrap your brain around that framework of I'm in a dental office. And um, one thing I noticed that uh, you know, watching the videos, going back to this slide, is that certain students you know, would be engaged more. They would be leaning up more, looking at the avatar and, and, and stuff. Some people were just, you know, just there wasn't the buy-in and they would, you know, be, be kicked back. But that was what the research was, is how much, you know, how, how much immersion do you get with that? And that was kind of interesting. And, and I think it's, it, I think um, it, like with anything in life, what you put into it is what you're gonna get out. So those people that were more engaged, more into it, I think got more out of it. But you know, you can be kicked back, laid back. I've, I've seen human interactions the same way. <laughs> you know, I get to see these videos. I'm one who runs all that at, at the Sim Center. And you know, you see some of the students come in and they sit back, they kick back. I'm like, would you, you know, I'd realize this is a interaction uh, that, that's not really technically real, but would you actually do that if this was really your patient and you're trying to, you know, get them to stop smoking or whatever else, or, you know, they have a back problem. So uh, that buy-in, but, um, but I think that, that that's one of the things that I noticed that, you know, people just didn't go, oh, this is like, you know, it's like a game or it's virtual reality. Some people really had that true buy-in. And I think that there's, therein lies, you know, the, the, the real the crux of that, that Second Life can provide. Um, 
also, like I you know, said, the other research that you know, we had done, obviously the dental patients in Second Life, uh, also looking at uh, physicians and artificial intelligence. There's no joke in there. If someone told me that, I was like, <laughs> physician and artificial intelligence, what do you mean by that exactly? So, but uh, no, and then also immersive virtual reality. So that, that, that immersion, what's the next level of the immersion? This is sort of the classical, that's the kind of the classic look that you see. I guess if you say classic in, in cutting edge technology, but you know, people kind of view this as the, as the you know, put on the goggles and you got the, and you got the hands and you, you, you're the one creating the movements and, and whatnot. And you know, obviously we're generations away from you know the holodeck type technology in Star Trek, but one thing that people have been working on is um, putting uh, you know a an actual brain interaction and using this device to be able to uh, move your avatars without actually physically moving, moving it with your brain. So there's been work uh, with that as well to. Uh, uh, move it, and then I, I find that interesting. I don't know how well exactly that works. They're, they're just starting doing some of that work, so I think that that's an interesting uh, aspect that that the future may hold, where you would just put this on, go into your second life, and you know be able to fly around. And I, I think that would be very interesting to just go think about it, and you just jump up and start and just go fly off, and you know how how your brain would interpret that and and, and what that would mean. So. Um, th there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of possibilities in the sky's the limit. I think it's people's creativity at at a university and 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 and, and in uh, in the private sector that can, can really uh, uh, take this technology and other technologies uh, you know uh, into the future and, and have a lot of knowledge and interaction and that would would hopefully lead back I into our own real real environments, which I think is is the ultimate goal of a lot of it. So. Do they pay for the x-rays of the patient? Oh, okay. you, uh, you can do that in Second Life, but that's just a way to actually obtain an object. So, it, no, no, no. But there is a currency in Second Life, but it's about 250 Linden dollars to one real US dollar. So, thank you, Drew. That's yes. great. And now we have Anita. Okay. Well, I just want to share some of my observations in Second Life. Um, I'll open with uh, one of my favorite quotes. Man is at least himself when he talks in his own person. Give him a mask and he will tell you the truth. And I have found that being in Second Life for a couple of years now, I have disclosed more information. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, not now. <laughs> but I need a mask, that's right. Um, and it's just, just amazing how... Um, how you can open up and how Second Life enables you to open up and tell your story and the truth as you see it more fully than you do um, in real life. And we, we tend to uh, honor the self-censorship that we've been taught through institutions. And we there's a, an incredible amount of um, relief when you don't have to do that in Second Life. And so my observations are coming to um, uh, three categories or three main ideas around community, identity, and diversity. And then what I've observed has implications in real life, especially in the area of leadership. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, from a community standpoint, um, there's a real push to, um, to form a community, especially when you meet the same people over and over again. So if you go to coffee shops or if you live in a community, um, there's a need for um, an assurance that we are truly a, a real community. And so some of the ways that we uh, model that behavior is, is looking for safety. In fact, I picked up that um, Sue, before she disclosed her story, she checked to see if it was safe enough to tell that part of her story. And that is something that we do in Second Life, especially when you are in a community where you have a residence. And uh, you want to check to see and be sure that there's enough psychological and emotional safety so that you can unfold more layers of who you really are. And I find that to be incredibly fascinating. Uh, when I first moved into the community that I live in, uh, one of the um, extensions of goodwill and sign that it was a safe community to be yourself in is that uh, first I was welcomed. They had a, um, a Ning page and I was on the Ning page and I was welcomed uh, through the Ning page and people IM'd me from the community and various artisans came over and they shared their furniture and paintings and antiques and so forth and I didn't have to pay any money and they were very low prim. And so... I was gonna say, is this real life or is it going 
It's a second, uh, second life. I wish it were a real life. But I just thought that was fascinating that they went out of their way to seek me out to make me feel comfortable. And, um, and so in likeness, I also offered what I could in terms of um, buying them dresses or paintings or whatever because it, it was a great thing to not have to pay for all that. Someone came in and outfitted my whole home and everything. I didn't have to worry about all that. So, yeah, so, uh, and then you get a sense of belonging. Again, because you show up every day or every other day or however, however frequently, there's a sense of belonging. And so um, when there's these, it seems like these three elements, goodwill, uh, emotional safety, and a sense of belonging, there's a tendency to relax and then you can you know, unfold more of who you are. Um, Another thing I find interesting is this whole idea of identity, um, being authentic and being able to tell the truth. And when you get accustomed to telling the truth, you tend to do that even in real life. And so things that you normally would say, well, I probably shouldn't bring it up because I don't want to offend someone or I don't want to be seen as an outsider. Um, you've learned in Second Life that you live through those difficult moments and you live through those difficult conversations and because you have done that you get confidence in realizing you're going to live through more of it and so you, there's a tendency to to find the right tone to find the right pitch but you still tell that story that ordinarily you would not have had that level of confidence um, had you not had the practice in second life and then you get really good at advocating for what you want and how you want it and what some of the outcomes that you expect in a transaction in Second Life. Um, if you have a role of leadership, and in one case I do, um, I get to talk about what my expectations are and what I would like to see come uh, as an outcome to some of the events that we plan. And again, you just get really comfortable with being honest about and being upfront about what exactly it is you want, and you don't have to manipulate um, events or manipulate outcomes yourself, but rather put them out there and work corporately to them or towards them. It's just a much more effective way of, of behaving uh, as a resident. And so that's another skill of learning how to advocate for what you want, and you're much more freer to do that because no one can really see you, and so they're not judging what you're saying based on what they see uh, in real life, which is just amazing to me. Um, and then there's this whole notion of reputation, and uh, kind of with that goes appearance. Uh, people, in fact, we just had a workshop uh, Tuesday or Monday of this week, and uh, one of the very first things that happened is people came into Second Life as, oh, this is crazy, I'm an avatar, look at me, to, oh my God, look at my hair, look at my clothes, when are we going to go shopping? And that was like at noon. It dawned on them that they should be uh, really concerned about what they look like, and that there is this notion about what they look like has something to do with who they really are in real life. I don't really look like that, do I? And so there's this whole thing about being associated with the right groups and being associated with the right look um, that I find to be really fascinating. And like you say, you get so attached to your avatar in almost no time. And then lastly, uh, seeing the world in different ways, this whole piece of diversity, um, seeing the world in different ways. And of course, in Second Life, you can be in Japan in one minute and in Spain the next minute, and you just can't do that in real life. And you're interacting sometimes with people native to those countries, and they're, they're explaining to you um, their point of view and the news from their point of view and world events from their point of view. And I find those to be really rich conversations. Um, and then having the ability to suspend judgment of others kind of goes back to your point about talking to uh, avatars that are not necessarily representative of human. And uh, some of my dearest friends in Second Life are objects. And I've come to learn that there's this whole community of asexuals in Second Life who don't identify as a gender. And I would suppose it's because they take that whole element of romanticism out of the equation and you deal with them on a very uh, intellectual basis. And they are quite intellectual people. So you cannot assail um, an avatar because they are a fox or they are a dolphin or a cat or my dearest friend who's a harlequin, a very pathetic looking harlequin. <laughs> Um, so you really can't um, assail them because they don't look like something that you would normally talk to on a daily basis, but uh, you learn to suspend your judgment of others and, and be more tolerant of others in their self-expression. And I think that's an important lesson to learn and to try out in, in uh, real life 
because I say to you know, a lot of my students that leadership is about learning how to bring out the best in people, and you do that best when you've suspended your judgment of them right away. And so when you can practice those skills in, in second life, you can easily translate them over um, into real life, and that balances out really well with the whole need of advocacy, learning how to be a good advocate. And then being comfortable in your own skin and the basis of any um, genuine, authentic interaction starts with your ability to be comfortable in who you are and in your own skin in real life as well as second life. And so because you can be in any skin you want to be in, you learn how to be more comfortable in real life because you have so much comfort in second life or you can, you can become very comfortable in second life. And so another observation which I find to be persistent and I think is a lot of fun, um, I thought I would turn the table and interact, get you guys to interact with me a little bit. So I asked this question, how would you describe the real life person operating each of these avatars? I took pictures of uh, some of my uh, dearest friends and uh, thought I would ask, what do you think they do? How would you describe their real life They're person? Not all you. I thought at mm -hmm. first maybe it was a trick question. And they were all you as different avatars, no? Am I giving it away? Yes. Oh, darn. <laughs> Say no. No. Say no. OK. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you had me thought I, I, I was totally going to go. No kidding, really? <laughs> well, uh, the whole idea here, Sue. <laughs> I'm never going to moderate a panel again. I'll never be on another panel with you again. <laughs> the whole idea is people project. <laughs> oh my God, people, people project. You know, they say, oh, well, this person's a nurse, and this person's a this, and this person's a that. <laughs> um, but the idea, you know, one of the things I found that the things that they project are somewhat true. Um, and what you cannot get away from, people think that you're hiding behind an avatar. But in essence, you, the essence of who you really are pours through. And there's nothing you can do to hide it. And especially if there's an intuitive person on the other receiving end of you, it could be picked up right away through the words you use, through the um, meter of your language, whether it be text chat or voice chat. It, has, it all has a meter and a rhyme to it. And you cannot hide from the essence of who you are. Now, I happen to be a fairly fragmented person. So I have four or five, I have four abs. And um, each of them live very uh, full lives, actually. Um, and the guy, I had to contort him so that <laughs> people wouldn't figure out it's the same one. But apparently, I didn't do a very good job. No, I just know you well enough to oh. know that probably that that's what you would do. But I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, the lady, at the, t the lady at the top is my work avatar. She doesn't get out much. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that was a per the persistent habit is that we tend to project onto other abs. And I would ask that, um, that we would suspend that, that need to do that because you learn a lot about people just by accepting them for who they are and what they present at the time. Okay. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm not. I'm gonna be quiet now. <laughs> um, any questions or any topics for discussion? Or are we we're all hot? Yes. Did you all know about the Munchausen by internet? No. Yeah, you know Munchausen by mm -hmm. proxy. Right. I'm sorry. Um, there's now been. Um, I, I think the psychologists have identified it as Munchausen by internet. Um, and it's because of the openness of the environment that mm -hmm. people come in and will fabricate uh, like serious illnesses or deaths in the family or whatever because they're trying to get the community to rally around and give support and pay attention to them. So it's a, it's a new psychological phenomenon that's actually being uh, documented pretty well. Um, and I just want to call your attention to some studying that they're doing out at Loyola Marymount in California on the ability of um, interactions in Second Life to impact real world behavior. And it's actually, they're getting good data on, on that. So that's my comments. That's fantastic. Yes. Thanks. Um, it seems most of what we talked about today was about revealing your true self mm -hmm. through these avatars. And it seems like that would be a good thing to do, and a lot of people would. But 
Do you know if anyone has ever successfully portrayed an entirely different personality or character through their avatar? Because I would think that would be incredibly possible to be not just because of the way you look, but, be, but because of the way you talk mm -hmm. and interact with others as well, that you could be very successful at being someone completely different. Have you seen that happen? Well, uh, not specifically that I know of with, with a specific individual, but there are entire islands on Second Life that are devoted to role play games. So, you know, you would come in and be an elf warrior or, um, you know, someone, a, a monster or whatever. And so there are whole communities surrounding just that kind of thing, pretending to be someone that you're not. Um, as far as, uh, and you know, there are all sorts of stories that hit, you know, the media about Second Life that, you know, don't do any good for us in, in the field of education. But um, I'm sure that there are people that do that all the time. And I think that speaks to the Munchausen by Internet uh, syndrome. Um, being able to falsify something completely. And I think there have been some studies done that do say that some people as avatars have more propensity to falsify than, you know, other, other than, um, and, and I can see it going both ways, you know, depending on what your personality is like. Um, but I myself have not discovered that I have been talking with someone that is completely, totally different than I know of, I don't know. But it was very interesting once, once voice chat came into, you know, the, the equation, you could tell, you know, whether someone, well, kind of, unless they were using a voice modulator, you could tell, you know, this, this person that you always thought was a woman is, is actually a guy. And um, I suppose that would be kind of upsetting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Stacy, can I ask you a question, even though you're not on the panel? <laughs> uh, Stacy was one of the researchers that uh, did the dental student study with us. And um, I know you did have an immersion uh, instrument that you gave to the students. We did. Uh, before. And it was, did you, have you looked at um, any of the videos that have been uh, recorded by Drew and to see if whether their reported ability to immerse themselves in, in a virtual environment corresponded to how in, you know they were interacting with the computer? It's a good question. We, we looked at the videos a little bit, but we didn't do any type of quantifiable study, per se, as we were trying to rate them. We looked mm -hmm. at them just to see what it looked like. Right, we, right. Took, we went off more student ratings, and what we mm -hmm. did was we asked the students their perception in terms Correct. In terms of how immersive was the environment, how helpful was it in terms of their learning, and how would they compare it in terms of looking at those three different types of conditions we wanted to look across, Second Life versus standardized patients versus um, a software program called NeuroTV, which was a puppeteer um, environment that Drew talked about. Again, just to, to compare those three platforms to see, one, how immersive were they? Two, how well did students perceive them in terms of really being able to get out the learning objectives in each of those environments? And what we found was there was no significant difference between any between the three at all. They treated them all the same. They felt like they learned the same um, from each of those. So we do need to go back and look now at the videos to see if that you know would really uh, corroborate what we saw from the students' aspect. But um, that's what it really showed, no significant difference, which is a, a wonderful finding for us. Yeah. Because if I have to pay a standardized patient $10, $15 an hour to run these students through, um, it gets costly. Where if in Second Life, as we know, it's a free environment once it's built out. Right, right. Um, it's just the instructor time that's puppeting the character behind. Um, so that's why we were excited and want to continue the research. Right. And I know they've done a lot in, at the Cleveland Clinic. I've been working with them, and they've been yeah. using standardized patients and uh, medical student avatars or you know doctor avatars to uh, simulate a psychiatric interview. So mm -hmm. the students have to come in their third year, um, third year medical students going through their psych rotation. They asked us to create a schizophrenic avatar uh, for for this purpose that had specific animations that were kind of like twitchy and looking around your shoulders, and and they have been using that very successfully. And um, as a matter of fact, I think we're going to be publishing that res those results pretty soon. And uh, it, some of the stuff that you're able to do in Second Life, you know, it, 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 
that you can't really do in a phone interview or, or is, is uh, really makes a big difference. So. Absolutely, and, and the one part that we have found challenging in communication sciences and disorders, for instance, we have a pediatric population, the same as with right, medicine, right. and and those are challenging to get standardized patients in, in due to chi child labor laws and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So again, Second Life was a prime opportunity for us um, to do that, and, and we do have child avatars in Second Life that we let our students practice with using voice modulation um, so that it actually sounds like a child. And if you watch the students interact um, in Second Life or with a, another type of avatar, the anxiety is there, just like it would be with a real patient. Um, and the nice part is they can't hurt them. So it, it, it makes for a great practice environment. Right, right, exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Anything else? I guess that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Actually, I wanted to, I, oh, I oh I'm I wanted, sorry. I wanted to leave everyone else to have a chance if there were other questions. But I did want to say one thing. As far as you, you, you'd ask about, um, you know, people faking who they were or whatever else, um, and the flip side of that, I, I have a, a friend and colleague of mine whose uh, daughter is autistic. And so he's wanting to get her more involved in Second Life because, you know, she's sort of, you know, kind of in her own shell. So the, the real person of who she really is can't really truly come out. And so he's read up a lot about this, and, and, and there's been studies and things like this, that, that people with autism who, who may not want to in, interact in the real environment feel intimidated or there's other issues of sight and sounds that they, they, they are not able to process in their brains have been able to do things within Second Life, and their nature, or hopefully, you know, you know parents are hoping that their true nature is coming out and they're able to create avatars and socially interact in environments that they would never be able to do uh, in, 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 in the real world, so to speak. So be able to do that. And then, actually, I don't know if you want to bring up the issue that you, we had talked about, about the one getting uh, hit on. The, the, would you bring that up already? Did you talk about that? Oh, the, oh, the, uh, one, of, um, one of the women in your study um, was talking to me about an experience that she had being hit on in Second mm -hmm. Life. Um, and uh, she said, I've never, ever had any experience like that at all. So, you know, she was a brave individual who obviously went out there and explored before, you know, the study w was performed. But uh, that was really interesting to hear her talk about that and how it really affected her, you know. Right. So the, the, those confidences that people could maybe, maybe garner in, way, in Second Life that might not be able to have a, you know, an avenue to do that in some other type of environment. If you're just, you know, thinking of, oh, you know, do I want to play World of Warcraft and be an elf? And you know, does that really does that really translate to, to anything in the real world? Or, or you know, I'm just going to blow up, you know, aliens. This allows you to have something where you might be able to. To, to be able to take what you have within the environment and bring that out, not just taking here and putting in. So I think that that's very powerful. Wow, we just made it 325. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Nita.